I'm very much looking forward to hearing what he's got to say about these uh, somewhat enigmatic, and I think it sounds like it's something that we're just starting to learn more and more about, uh, these racetrack type features. So I'm going to turn it over to Will, and uh, we're going to hear about back and forth out on the landscape and uh, what racetracks are all about. Will, thanks so much. Thank uh, you, Bill. ASU graduate student. Thank you. Everybody hear me okay? You can hear it? Okay, thank you guys for coming tonight. Um, this is kind of nostalgic for me and I'm excited to be here. I did a lot of my earlier work on uh, racetracks up in the Perry Mesa area, North Central Arizona. And it's been a few years since I've been up there. So this is kind of a, it's nice for me to get back in the area and talk about this stuff. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces in the crowd. I've worked out there on the landscape with several of you guys and I appreciate the work you've put in there and, and uh, hope you, hope aren't too disappointed tonight. So in 2006, I was an undergrad at ASU and I signed up for a field class with Kate Spielman and Dave Abbott. And we went out on the Perry Mesa uh, landscape up there in Black Mesa on the Alfreya National Monument. And it was called the Legacies on the Landscape Project. It was a multidisciplinary project where we were looking at um, archeological and uh, biological interaction and, and the legacies that that left on the modern landscape. And when I was up there, I ran across these, uh, a few of these things that people were calling racetracks, but nobody really knew what they were at the time. Uh, maybe we still don't. Uh, they were like short, uh, narrow clearings. Basically, they looked like small roads that were near some of the largest Pueblos. And folks knew about uh, six of them on Perry Mesa, two of them on Black Mesa, which is just on the other side of the Alfreya River. And then in the middle Verde, uh, valley, there were five more that were known. So people knew about these, they didn't know what they were, nobody had ever really given them a whole lot of concerted thought, but everybody seemed to be interested in them. And it seemed like a lot of people had different theories. Some people thought that they were um, historic features, you know, parts of roads that had been uh, abandoned, or uh, landing strips for uh, narco traffickers, and some of them have been used for that. Um, so back then in 2006 when I started, I, I had like a three-pronged approach. The first part being that I wanted to find, to see if there were more of these out there. Uh, the second, to, to document them and analyze them and try to get all the data I could from them. And the third being to try to figure out what exactly they were. And in talking with Kate Spielman, um, it became clear that up on Perry Mesa, there's not um, the same level of integrative features that we see in other parts of the Southwest at that time and around that time. There aren't ball courts, there aren't platform mounds, there aren't great kivas. They didn't seem to have anything like that, but we did have these enigmatic racetrack features. And so we wondered, could those have played some kind of role in integrating this community? I'll start off by talking about how we found more. Like I said, there were um, eight of these known in the Perry Mesa, Black Mesa area and five more in the Middle Verde. We were able to look at those using satellite imagery and high altitude aerial imagery and kind of get a fingerprint for what these things looked like from the air. And then we were able to branch out from there and look at um, other parts of the landscape, see if we saw similar features from the air. And if so, we could then go visit these on, on the ground and ground truth them, see if we were looking at the same thing. So we also were fortunate enough to come across some declassified military aerial photos that were taken in 1940. And these were very, um, they played a key role in the investigation because a lot of these were taken of areas up on the mesa tops before there was mechanized travel up there. And so we were able to see what the landscape looked like before people were driving cars and Jeeps and so forth. Um, I know a lot of you have driven up there, right? I don't, I don't know if anybody else has had the pleasure of driving with Mike Hugendike, but that's a, <laughs> experience all in itself. Um, but you very rarely get to go in a straight line. You're always going up really fast or down or, or to the side or nearly tipping over. But every once in a while you get to a place where the road levels out and it goes perfectly straight. Um, and these tend to be near Pueblos. And what I suspected and what we've been able to confirm is that a lot of those places were in fact these racetrack features. Um, and when people go up there, 
over the past you know, 80 some years, they take advantage of this. And I can't say I blame them. They didn't know what they were doing, but they find a level patch of ground, you're gonna drive on it. And, and that's what was happening. So all things told at this point, conservatively, we can say that there are 77 of these in North Central Arizona. Um, that includes 18 that have been uh, confirmed on the ground and uh, documented in, in detail. Uh, nine more that have been confirmed on the ground, but not necessarily documented in as much detail and mapped and so forth. And the remainder of those are extraordinarily convincing from the air. We haven't actually been to them yet, um, but they're located at known pueblos. They look from the air exactly like the ones that have been visited and confirmed. Now, if we get a little more liberal um, and we expand these to uh, linear anomalies that we can see from the air, but we don't know if they're near Pueblos and so forth, then the number gets bumped to 130. So there are a lot of these things out there. There's a lot more room for uh, investigation of them. My dissertation took another track, so I'm no longer at this point working up there on them. I think it'd be a shame if, if somebody doesn't pick up that ball, and I hope somebody does, and I hope to be back um, working with them again in the future. So the second part of, uh, well, let's talk about what they are, actually, because people, you know, we throw around this term racetrack, and we don't really, like I said, we didn't know what they were at first. We, maybe we still don't. But basically, we're talking about long um, linear clearings, and usually they're, or they're all between 10 and 15 meters wide. The length on them varies quite a bit. The shortest one is 61 meters long. The longest confirmed is 448 meters long. So there's a lot of variation in length, but not, not hardly any in width. Okay. Sometimes, in fact, almost always, there will be a, a formal or a semi-formal clearing or plaza type area. Most often it's at one end. Some of them are amorphous, some are square, some are round, and so forth. Sometimes there will be at, at both ends. Um, there's almost always a large roasting pit associated with these. And these are the types where they would cook the agave hearts to make pulque and also you know, edible agave flesh. And a lot of the times these are the, the kinds, they're like a donut shaped ring of fire cracked rock and so forth. So they're, these are known to people who've worked in the Perry Mesa area and to some, to a lesser extent in the Tonto Basin, they'll see these ring shaped, <coughs> excuse me, fire pits. Oftentimes there'll be in conjunction with the, with the features, bedrock grinding facilities, matates and mortars and so forth that are right alongside or near the track. Oftentimes we'll get boulders that are placed along the edges to delineate where it is. Um, the soil in here is, tends to be different. Um, there's less gravelly, it's, it's of a finer texture. And um, I'll talk in a little bit about why we think that is. But it's all the rocks, and this is a volcanic landscape up there for the most part. So all the, the basalt cobbles have been moved off to the side and sometimes either stacked neatly there or just tossed off, tossed off to the side. And this surface here is, tends to be depressed, you know, about 10 centimeters or more. Um, right. And they're also, it's very rare to find artifacts on them. Um, lithic artifacts and pottery is almost non-existent on the, on the feature itself. When we do find something, and we do find this quite a bit, it tends to be broken food preparation tools, especially tabular basalt um, knives or agave knives. Um, but also to a lesser degree, ground stone. We find a lot of broken monos, uh, portable matatis, pestles, and so forth. Always broken, and uh, always in conjunction with the, with the surface itself. So this is what we're looking at out there on the landscape. And I went back and I looked through ethnographic, ethnohistoric, and archeological materials to try to find things similar to these through space and time. See if somebody else had ever discussed something like this um, that could give us some clue as to what we're looking at. So archeologically, there are very few things like this. There are some down in uh, Casas Grandes that uh, Waylon and Minas have uh, categorized as, as fairly informal ball courts that are not terribly unsimilar to this. Um, 
Frank Russell in the early 1900s uh, described two subipiri features um, down along the uh, Babacomri River in southeastern Arizona that were fairly similar to this. Um, and there are one or two that are, uh, that are kind of similar up at some Hopi villages. But these were, interestingly, these are villages of peoples from the northern Rio Grande, the eastern Pueblo district, who had come over there um, during the Pueblo revolt period. Um, and they, they had some features like this. So archaeologically, we don't have a lot of things that are similar to this. We also have, you know, Dave Wilcox at one point had compared he had, uh, well, he had pointed out at Snake Town that there is a feature somewhat like this, and he had alternately called it a, a processional entranceway and a, uh, and a possible racetrack. So let me back up a little. When we talk about racing, this was something totally new to me when we talk about Aboriginal racing in the Southwest. And I had to pretty much let go of everything I knew of about racing and, and running and so forth and kind of start from ground zero. And, you know, I'll break the surprise, you know, I ended up thinking, and I do think these are ceremonial racetracks. So let's talk about racing in the Southwest. Ethnographically, historically, every single native community in the Southwest has had ceremonial racing as part of its uh, religious repertoire. Um, it's always a secondary function, it's never primary. It's always complementing other aspects of religion but everybody has historically raced. And there are several reasons for this. It's not like when we race in modern Western society, it's not necessarily a competition, although there is a competitive angle to it. Um, it's primarily about self-sacrifice. We can compare it to say the sun dance complex of the Plains Indians, where when you're making prayers and you're asking for things, you recognize that nothing comes for free. So you're basically giving weight to your own prayers by forcing yourself to undergo um, traumatic experiences. And ethnographically, we have instances of foot races here in the Southwest that went on for days at a time. That went on to the point where people dropped dead on the track. That's how committed they were to, to doing this, to showing that they were willing to suffer to this extent for their community. So racing, all, and those prayers, I should say, were almost always for moisture, for rain, snow, and so forth. That shouldn't come as a surprise here in the Southwest for uh, agriculturalists that's you know, obviously needed for crops to grow and whatnot. So racing also is a way to tie um, the present, the uh, ethnographic present, to the mythic past. If you look at the mythology of native groups in the Southwest, racing plays a prominent part. And it often has to do with um, moral lessons, uh, teaching kids how to behave, how, what the right thing to do is. It also helps explain how animals and people interact, how deities and people interact, and how, what, the, what the proper way to go through life is. A lot of these are tied up with racing. So historically, when we see people, native peoples racing, it is not only self-sacrifice and prayer for water, but it's also a way of tying themselves in the present and the, the modern community back to the, uh, the ancient past. One of the other important aspects of racing ethnographically is integration. And it, racing helps integrate within and across communities. There are a lot of instances we know of where communities would be, say, on the brink of warfare or something, and they agree, everybody agreed, okay, we're gonna get together and we're gonna race, and, and it saved you know, bloodshed and so forth. So those kind of stories aren't uncommon. Um, more common, however, are the ones of internal integration, where different clans or moieties or sodalities within a community come together and race. And Peter Nabokov, an anthropologist, wrote about this, and his, um, I like a quote of his. He said, when these different clans come together to race against each other, it's the together part that matters, not the against part. And so periodically, when they come together to race, it's reminding everybody that despite our differences, our different memberships and our differences in identity, 
we all belong to the same community and it cross cuts those lines that otherwise would have divided the community. So archeologically, ethnographically and ethno-historically across the board, everything I was able to find that compared favorably to these suggests that they were in fact ritual racetracks. Now that's not to say that all racetracks are the same. In fact, there, there's quite a bit of variability in the Southwest. Most often ritual racing is um, uh, circuitous and doesn't involve necessarily a, a formal structured facility. It'll be, okay, we're gonna race from the Pueblo here off the Mesa and over to that hill over there and back or something. So the, the actual physical place isn't necessarily as important. There are a few cases where we have straight tracks like this historically, and primarily those are in the Odom areas along the uh, Yuma River and in the Eastern Pueblo area. Those are the three areas where we tend to get straight racetracks like this. Um, archaeologically, the best fits are in the Odom area, but historically, the Odom seemed to have shifted from using constructed facilities like this to using very ephemeral facilities, where basically like two marker sticks would be planted in the ground, say, and they would, they'd have their race, and then when they're done, the sticks are pulled, everybody leaves, and that place doesn't hold any more uh, special meaning or value. Um, in the eastern Pueblo area, the northern Rio Grande, however, that's not the case. The place does hold special value. They have races in the same place, uh, the same times of the year, um, and for generations and generations, that's where you go to do your ceremonial racing. And so a lot of the Pueblos over there have tracks that are quite similar to this. And some of the sub-features over there we see quite a bit. Like we'll see paired um, rocks at the end that are probably used for some type of uh, demarcation for where uh, relay runners are allowed to pass each other. But th we see those in the eastern uh, Pueblo, and we see them up on Perry Mesa too. So that's interesting. Um, what, we, what, is a, what we see is a big difference, however, is in the eastern Pueblo area, um, more often than not, tracks are laid out east to west. Um, and that has to do with their belief that racing also helps maintain celestial balance. It helps the sun come up and go down and the moon and so forth and keeps the stars in order and whatnot. So it's, it's not 100% of the time that uh, Rio Grande Pueblo tracks run east and west, but more often than not, they do. That's not the case um, in, in Arizona, in the central Arizona tracks. These, and that's one of the first questions I generally get is, well, could these point at something? And it could, but if that's the case, I haven't been able to figure it out. They, the azimuth that they point toward, those run 360 degrees. Um, there's one pointing in pretty much every direction. I worked with the uh, US Naval Observatory to retrodict um, sunrises and sunsets for uh, the P3, P4 period. And most of these could never align with any sunrise or sunset. So I don't think that's the case of, of anything like that. They don't, some of them point towards significant hills on the landscape, but most of them don't. So I don't think that the way that they point um, is, is significant necessarily. So, Let's talk about uh, distribution. So I told you how we found these things, and we found quite a bit of them, and, and so spatial distribution isn't a problem. We can plot these on a map, and we can see where they go. And it's, it's a fairly big range. It runs on the west from the Bradshaw Mountains over to the Matazal Wilderness on the east side, um, from the Cave Creek area um, north of the valley here on the south up to um, Stoneman Lake. Um, but that doesn't give us really a good picture of what's going on because that's a palimpsest of, of uh, different times. So we can break these down into, or what I've done, is break them down into those that date to the Pueblo III period, or 1100 to uh, 1300, and, or the Pueblo IV period, 13 to 1450. And because all of these, not all of them, I take that back, the vast majority of these date to Pueblos that are either Pueblo III, Pueblo IV, or uh, multi-component that span both of those. The ones at the multi-component sites, we don't know when those were made. They could have been made during the early, the P3, or the late, the P4. 
We can't tell. What I can tell with some certainty is that whenever they were made, they were used throughout the uh, occupation of the site. They, they continued to be used through the P4 period. And that's because no other features intrude into them. They took measures to keep midden from getting onto the tracks. They were obviously uh, maintained up until the end. So when we, uh, this is when I disappoint everybody because Linda said, oh, Will's a great artist, but that's when I'm given plenty of time. So let's say this is the, uh, the Agua Fria River there, and this is the, the Verde here. So that's Perry Mesa, Black Mesa. This is the Bradshaw Mountains. That's Bloody Basin, uh, Polis Mesa, and say this is Camp Verde here. And this is Phoenix. So let's first consider the ones that we know that we can positively date to the Pueblo III period. These are the early ones, and there aren't too many of them. We have one here at the base of the Bradshaws below Black Mountain, running Deer Pueblo. Um, we have one on Perry Mesa. We may have one in Bloody Basin, probably do. Probably one on Polis Mesa. Um, and then we have one, two, three up here and Cahaba Springs down here and a Humboldt House here. So you can see these are far flung. There's, there's very few of them and there's no spatial consistency to them. They're throughout this general area here. And they seem to be uh, bound by natural geographic um, areas. We have one in this valley here. We have one in Bloody Basin. We have this one down here in the northern periphery. But over time, what we see is that all these go away, except for these here. And over time, if we look at the ones that we know are from the P4 period, they're all here on Black Mesa and Perry Mesa, except for two. We have one here in Bloody Basin, where we probably already had one. And we have one here on Polis Mesa, where we probably already had, had one earlier. And so we go from this pattern where they're spread out, they're there are very few of them and they're spread out to later in time where they're all consolidated right here. And so that's interesting to me. That's, uh, we know from work that um, Scott Ingram did as part of his ASU dissertation that at that point in time, the P3, P4 transition, that Perry Mesa becomes one of the best places to be in the Southwest if you're a farmer. Um, just, it's like all the, all the clouds aligned, so to speak. And if you're gonna farm in the Southwest, that's, that's one of the top places. And so we get a lot of immigration there, a lot of people showing up from different parts of the Southwest. Um, and we get this sudden clustering of racetracks. So I wondered about that. And I took what I had learned about how race, racing and racetracks are used in the ethnographic Pueblo world and tried to apply that to the archeological pattern that we're seeing here. Now, like I had said earlier, we know that every historic native group in the Southwest has used racing. And a big function of that is um, to integrate communities. We also know that when these different people moved here from all these different places in the Southwest, they dropped a lot of things. The things that told us uh, that would yell out where they came from, those are gone. Um, Stone and Leip have said that when you, when you get people moving into a new area, there are two basic strategies they can follow, standing out or fitting in. You can say, this is who I am, this is where I came from, and deal with it. Or you can jettison a lot of that stuff and kind of try to fit in with the locals. But what, what happens when there aren't any locals? I mean, prior to that, this was a fairly sparse landscape. So you have a ton of people showing up all of a sudden. We're not too many, not very many people had been prior to that. Now, the people from down here, they didn't bring their platform mounds up there. They forgot about that. The people from up here didn't bring their, uh, their great kivas. They forgot about that. Everybody left that stuff and they stopped making decorated pottery. They were coming from places that were making a lot of decorated pottery that were probably tied with their uh, social identities but they stopped doing that. They just started making plainware pottery and racetracks. And so what I've argued um, in the past 
is that this may have been some type of religious movement and that it may have been tied to this fact that we had so many people coming from different places trying to fit in. And so maybe what they did was they stripped away or de-emphasized the things that made them different. Things like great kivas and platform mounds and ball courts and redware pottery and black and white pottery. Those things that made them different, they de-emphasized. And the things that they had in common, they emphasized and they elevated those to a primary position within the community. And if we look historically at what two things did everybody have in common, those are racing and feasting. And that's what I think was going on here, is I think this racing became elevated because it was something everybody had in common. It was kind of a, a common language. And also feasting, you know, everybody, every culture um, uses feasting for integration. And I think those two went hand in hand, and we know that they did historically. And that's my, uh, my take on what was happening during the Perry Mesa tradition, during the uh, early P4 period. So, I have a feeling I'm really overlooking a lot of stuff, but I want to get involve you guys. So what do you guys think? Or do you have questions or? I, I've got the microphone here. I'll start at the back and we'll work our way forward. Having read a lot of the archeological Southwest uh, quarterlies, I'm still a little confused geographically where Perry Mesa is, please. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I had a beautiful slide, but they wouldn't let me use PowerPoint. Um, if, you, if you start here in Phoenix and you're driving up toward Flagstaff, have you made that drive? Oh, yeah. Okay. So after you go through Black Canyon City and, and you have to slow down for all the trucks and so forth, and then you break out up onto the top and Sunset Point is right there, there you go. You're right on top of Black Mesa at that point, and right across that gorge is Perry Mesa. And coincidentally, if you look at the 1940 aerial photos, you'll see uh, what looks to be, what I'm convinced was, a really nice racetrack um, next to a Pueblo, which is now directly under the uh, Sunset Point rest stop. A <laughs> uh, question I had. Um, are you quick to, do you, to uh, disallow that being a ball court? And I'm thinking the Aztec out of Mexico, uh, playing ball was the, a big uh, source of their enjoyment. And they had courts similar to what you describe here. They were large, they were slender and long. However, the losing team was killed. And, and that is not a, a good uh, spectator sport, I guess. But uh, could this have been a, a ball court uh, that they shared with other tribes as a way instead of making war? It, it absolutely could. And I'm glad you brought that up. It's something that I've been thinking about. Um, I'm working with a project now where we're looking at connections between Mesoamerica and the Southwest. And what we see in Mesoamerica is that throughout time, there's this complex of ball court and platform mound. And those go side by side, and they seem to be, you know, they're this matched pair. You, you don't have one, you have both. Um, in the Hoakam world, it seems to be more a matter of emphasis, where during the pre-classic period, you did have platforms but they were small in comparison to what they would later become. And you also had uh, this huge uh, emphasis on ball courts, which are very formalized. Then later during the classic period, you stop seeing the construction of ball courts. And depending on who you talk to, there may or may not have been continued use of the ones that were already there. But they definitely started putting more emphasis on the, on the platforms. And so yeah, I've wondered if these racetracks, which do start um, when the, uh, when the emphasis on formalized ball courts goes away, or shortly after that, um, if those could be just, for lack of a better term, like a watered down version of a ball court. Um, and, you know, Fuchs had said that he wondered if some of these narrow alley-like features at platform mount compounds could have been uh, race ways. And, you know, that's definitely it's definitely a possibility. So yeah, I would say, I don't think the ball game necessarily ever left. I mean, even up into historic times, um, Oadam were playing ball games very similar to what they played in Mesoamerica. Um, so you can, you can see a progression there. So I, I think that there, that's definitely a, an avenue of further research is that these could be just a watered down, de-emphasized version of a ball court where you continue to, to see a ball game being played. So you pretty much 
answered my question, but I was thinking to flip it around a little bit. And if you didn't know that a uh, Hohokam ball court was a ball court in the sense of we think we know this, but um, if you came at those features you know, knowing what you know about your racetracks, um, what do you think the odds are of what, that what we're calling a ball court in fact, may have been functionally much more like what you're describing as a racetrack. I mean, if you go to your drawing on the first slide and basically push the, the side walls of your, um, your racetrack out into a give them a little bit of a bow shape, you've essentially drawn a ball court. And so. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, I, I hadn't thought about it that way. It, it is, one of the main differences, though, is this is at most one course high. Um, there aren't necessarily walls like there are with Hohokam courts, but, but yeah, that's a good point. And, you know, this, this is pretty much exactly like what Whalen and Menace described as their, like, lowest tier of unformal ball court down at Pakime. Will, I have a couple of questions. The first one is exactly about or approximately how wide are these paths? These are all between 10 and 15 meters wide. Can you, how, how wide is that in feet? Uh, about 20, 25 feet. 20, 25 feet, okay. Now, what is the difference in these than those that are found along the Colorado River um, in the Yuma area? Those in Toglios or geoglyphs or, or whatever, not glyphs, but um, I think you know what I mean. Those things that are found along um, geoglyphs, is that what they're called? Um, they have those along the Colorado River in the mm -hmm. Yuma County area that were made by the peoples there. Have you studied those or what the similarities are with these? Because it looks very similar to me. Except that they were not that wide, you know. Right, yeah. I, I'm sure I'm going to offend some people when I start talking about, like, um, geoglyphs and so forth. But I think there's a, an artistic quality. I mean, that's what I would use to describe those. Um, whereas I don't see that with these, um, these seem to be, and I could be wrong, but they seem to be very functional. They, they don't appear in other shapes or anything. They're just uh, straight lines. Yeah, but the ones in the Yuma area were straight lines like that, and they had the little areas like a gathering part at the front and back, and they had the agave pits. I mean, they were exactly the oh, way okay. you're explaining these. And in the 80s and 90s, Boma Johnson made a study of them, talking with the Yuma people, the Kok, uh, the Kok, um, Kokopa and the Kwachan that live along there. And they said that they were their dance areas where they would shuffle along and remove uh -huh. the patina as they shuffled and, and chanted and danced. And, and you know, yeah. I guess it was like a, a, a very special area for ritualistic kind of activities rather than the racing is what they had come up with, with what they were using those for over there. Okay. I don't know. If no, that's a very good point. I, uh, I was not aware of those. Uh, oddly enough, I had talked with Boma um, right before my world got turned upside down. So we never really got the chance to like meet up and share notes and so forth. Yeah, I, I went on several uh, site tours with him and saw these myself. Okay. And that's what he uh, had described them as being. And apparently he did quite a, you know, took a lot of oral history from the native people in that area. And that's what they told him they were used for. Well, that sounds like a great avenue for, for further research. Thanks. No, not him. <laughs> I will. <laughs> um, in addressing the issue of ball court versus racing, mm -hmm. I know they found balls in conjunction with the courts. Um, has there ever been anything in the archaeological record in terms of balls with what you're referring to as racetracks? Um, not necessarily as as directly, but I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that up. We do find, and I'm sure archaeologists find throughout the Southwest, uh, stone balls that are about the size of like a billiard ball. And we found those at several of these tracks that have race tracks, not like sitting right on the track, unfortunately, but, but at the sites. And we know ethnographically, like a lot of communities, both in central Arizona as well as the western Pueblos, have used those for like kicking during these races. And there's a lot of metaphor wrapped up in ceremonial racing. And, that, and that's a, this is one of the more interesting ones, is if you live in an area with um, like sandstone, 
like chunks of sandstone will get tumbled down arroyos by flash floods and over time they'll become round. And so they would find these and they know what makes them round. So they'd find these out in the washes and that, that would be special to them um, because it's, it's wrapped up with the concept of flash floods and water and, and so forth when you need it. Um, and so they would then use those during the races. And so I think that kind of speaks to what you're asking. It also reminds me of a good point. What, we're, what I'm now realizing too is a lot of these racetracks, one end of them will be built like kind of tucked into a very subtle end of a drainage. And I'm not talking like a canyon head or anything like that, but where two small like hills, you know, kind of converge where the slopes converge. And during a downpour, I could see that that'd be where water would start running. Um, definitely not perennially, but during a downpour. And I wonder if that's what was going on there too, is if they were kind of tying in that heavy rainfall events with the, with the start of a, of a racetrack there. So Will, in terms of uh, to construct one of these, is it just clearing or are they leveling? Or what would be the process of, of uh, if I, you told me to go out and build one, what would you tell me to do? Yeah, that seems variable too. I mean, for the most part, it seems like they would pick within a reasonable distance from the Pueblo, the most, the longest, flattest, levelest area. So it would take the least amount of effort. Excuse me. That being said, there were some times when they went out of their way to make things difficult, and I'm not sure why. At Baby Canyon, for instance, you have the slope, a hill slope going down to the edge of the, the drop off, and they placed um, the track instead of up on the top of the hill, which would have been you know, another 50 meters away, um, down on that slope. So they had to excavate down on the uphill side and build retaining walls on the downslope side to make a level playing field. So obviously there was some reason why they wanted it right there running parallel to the edge of the cliff, but you know, that's not a consistent feature. You know, more often than not, um, they're not running parallel to the cliff. You said you were going to discuss why the soil was different? Yeah, yeah. Um, historically, we know that um, ritual racetracks, I mean, it's a, it's a sanctified place, it's like a church. So they go out of their way to keep them clean. A lot of times they go out and sweep them and that would get rid, uh, we think of a lot of the larger cobbles um, and, and leave a finer stuff there. Then at the same time, they're being compacted by the running and so forth. So you're getting the, the, the dirt being pounded up and the larger parts of it swept away. We think that's not only why it's a different uh, soil consistency, but also, you know, there's heavier compaction there for sure. And then also like the swaled effect. So it's, it's like a shallow ditch almost. It's interesting, if you go out there right after rains, um, these will retain water. You, you'll have like a long linear puddle and yet the soil is so different that vegetation still, still doesn't grow in them for the most part. They retain more water than the landscape next to it, but the soil, the, the compaction or soil quality somehow is, is different enough that it doesn't um, you know, promote plant growth. Is there a typical length of these things? Do they fall within a certain range? And then on that same note, when you look at the geoglyphs around the Colorado River, most of them are, um, I guess you'd call them figurative. Mm -hmm. But there are a few that are geometric and do have some long stretches within them, which might be two different activities. I don't know, what do you think? Oh, that's that's a good point. I'm not familiar with the with the geoglyphs over there, so I can't really speak to that. But that's definitely something to to look at in the future. As far as the length, uh, no, that varies quite a bit. I mean, there seems to be a fairly uh, normal distribution, anywhere from you know 70 uh, meters up to like 500 meters. Um, and I don't think that's we we put a big deal on that when it comes to racing. Um, but what I found is Aboriginally, there, there wasn't because it wasn't the length of the track didn't matter. It was usually races were often um, laid out by time, so it, you're, you're going to run for like 12 hours today. So the length of the track, the only difference that makes is how many times you turn around at the end, um, so to speak. So I'm curious about the agave pits. <coughs> mm -hmm. Is there any thought or ethnographic evidence to? Uh, the agave roasting ceremony or like a rite of passage ceremony or anything tying that to the racetracks? So, um, how do they relate? 
Not that I'm aware of specifically with agave, um, but with feasting, yeah, there's there's a definite link between um, feasting in general and and the uh, and racing. And like one of the earliest tracks we have on Perry Mesa is called the uh, Rattlesnake Egg Ruin track. I didn't name it. Um, but there, it's a very small Pueblo. It's probably like a 30 room Pueblo. And they're like surrounding it. They're probably um, five or 600 bedrock matatis, you know, around the Pueblo and the racetrack. So, I mean, that's one line of evidence to suggest that people, it was drawing people in and that they were preparing a lot of food. Um, and like I mentioned before, we, we find a lot of the, uh, the broken um, food preparation tools in conjunction with the tracks. And Betsy Brandt had even suggested at one point that perhaps, um, because ceremonial racing by and large is a, is a male dominated aspect of religion, and that maybe the preparation of the food and then sacrificing of the, of the tools, which are costly to make, may have been a female component to, to that complex. Now, the fact that um, the racetrack is located near the living area of a village, that tends to mean that it is something that they did a lot as much as living. Uh, whereas um, if it was a sport, would it necessarily be near the living area and, and part of that existence? Or would it be somewhere else where they could go out and, and meet uh, other villagers so that they could have racing? I think there's, there's uh, some of both going on there. Um, I'm, I'm hesitant to use the word sport because there's so much baggage in Western society wrapped up in that. But we do have them that are right next to Pueblos, and we also have some that are probably associated with Pueblos, but they're not, you know, they might be 100 meters away or something. And then we have some that are just flat out in the middle of nowhere, um, where they're like midway between two large Pueblos who both have their own racetrack. So I, I don't really know why we have one out there um, for, for nothing. I think possibly one of the reasons why these seem so distinct to us in this area is because it is a volcanic landscape and there are all these uh, small basalt cobbles and large boulders. Um, and if you want to run without breaking your ankle, you know, you have to move that off. So whereas if you were down here in the valley and you wanted to make a racetrack, it probably wouldn't be as visible today because you, you don't have that obstacle that you have to get out of the way. So we're, we're probably missing a lot there. I know that there's, there's one that was recorded by Dave Hart um, in the northern periphery at the Cahava Springs site, and that was a sedentary period of Ocon, uh, village. Um, so they're probably, they're probably more out there, and they're just not as visible because they didn't have to move that matrix off to the side. Um, but, yeah, it's hard. I, I'm not trying to dodge your question. I, I guess I, I really don't know. I, I think it's a very important, historically we know it was a very important component of daily life that um, not only was it for special occasions, but also even um, when fathers would have their sons out in the fields, you know, chasing rabbits away, if, if nothing else was going on, they would have them doing like small ad hoc ceremonial races to help draw in the rain. You mentioned earlier the uh, long distance endurance running, even to the point of death, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, would this have been on one very long track, would have been back and forth, and what is the evidence to support that? Well, s some of each, um, as far as track-wise. Like I said, in the Southwest, mo more often than not, ceremonial racing takes place on uh, non-formal surfaces, and usually a, like a preordained route. Like everybody will agree on where you're gonna be running, and that's what you do. There's not necessarily a, a, a formal feature like this. As far as the people, the, the fatalities, those are historically recorded um, at Pueblos where I, you know, they, they didn't do an autopsy, so I don't know if it was like a heart attack or something, but yeah, they're historically documented. Do, does this phenomenon, the, what you're describing to us, is it exclusively, I know the lady said something about the Yuma area, but is, what you're aware of, is it exclusively along the Agua Fria? Nowhere else in the Southwest? The, the straight tracks like this? Yes. Yes. Okay, prehistorically, 
They're, they're definitely concentrated here along the Alafria, Black Mesa, Perry Mesa area. There are also some, the ones in the uh, uh, Bloody Basin, the middle Verde area, Bloody Basin, Polis Mesa, and so forth. Um, later in time, those seem to, for the most part, drop out as, as we start seeing more on Perry Mesa. Much later in time, during the proto-historic period, or when we, when Frank Russell documented those two Sabai period ones um, down near Wachuca City in Cochise County, um, assuming those were racetracks, but those are actually very similar to these. They have the same end marker styles and the same construction and so forth. Yeah, we do. There are two sites up there. Um, I can't. I'm sorry. I, I definitely can't remember, and I wouldn't be able to pronounce them. But there are two uh, refuge sites where Eastern Pueblo folks um, came from the northern Rio Grande during the uh, during or around the time of the Pueblo Revolt, and came up onto uh, First Mesa there. Have you noticed whether there's a correlation between shorter length trails or raceways and proximity to habitation sites? Like, could they be representational more than functional? Um, I did look at a lot of things like formality and length and width and so forth and tried to cross correlate those, um, you know, amongst themselves. And the only uh, no, to answer your question, that I, I wasn't able to find anything statistically significant like that. The, the only thing I could find is that uh, the level of formality seemed to cluster um, spatially. And so basically the interfluve between, you know, uh, between Perry Tank Canyon and um, Baby Canyon seemed to be um, relatively longer and um, more formalized. Well, in terms of uh, the preservation issues related to these kinds of features, now that they've been uh, documented out on the landscape there, are they being protected or are they still being driven over? What's the status of that, that issue? That's, that's the hope. I'm still working on a, a BLM report and one of the um, deliverables there is to come up with ways to protect these. And now that they are being recognized, we can see, like for instance, two of the most visited ones are at a Rattlesnake Mate and Rattlesnake House up on Perry Mesa. And for all intents and purposes, one of those has been turned into a road. Um, the, the BLM road just goes right onto it. And you know, I'm not blaming anybody. Nobody knew these were there or anything. But yeah, now that we're becoming more aware of what they are and, and that they do need protecting, um, we're gonna be working with BLM to try to closed roads and so forth. Fortunately, some of these are far enough off, you know, the beaten path that, you know, you're not going to get a vehicle to them um, anytime soon. Hi, Will. Hi. I liked your presentation very much, by the way. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, do you find burials in association with these racetracks? And if you do, what patterns of burial practices do we see? I. I'm not aware of any association between burials and tracks. I don't dig burials. Um, I don't work on projects that, that have. Um, I can tell you up in that area, there's a lot of variability as far as burials are concerned. Um, and I think that's due to a lot of people coming in from a lot of different areas and bringing their traditions with them. But I, there's no association that I'm aware of between the tracks themselves and the uh, and burials. Hi again. Um, I liked your presentation also, but um, I was going to ask you, am I echoing? Sorry. Um, you said that you switched um, your direction of your dissertation a little bit. Um, I was wondering if you were to continue along this path of investigating racetracks, what do you think the further research is that needs to be done in the area, or what would have you done yourself? Um, the plan had been that I was going to excavate some of these roasting pits to try to get more concrete dates to go along with these um, in association with also maybe doing the uh, OSL dating of soil underneath some of the boulders that, were, that we know were definitely moved. Because um, right now we're kind of in a corner where we have to rely on ceramic dates um, for sites associated with tracks. And there are a, lot of, there are a few assumptions that go along with that. Um, those being that we have to assume that the tracks and the nearest Pueblo are, are uh, contemporaneous 
which is probably correct, but we don't necessarily know that. And the other thing that um, solid dating would really help us with is determining when the tracks at multi-component sites were built, because right now there are a lot of those, but the data are just kind of awash to some degree because, because we don't know when those were constructed. Thank you. Mm -hmm. On my first trip to Perry Mesa, there was a um, site pointed out to me as a racetrack and I don't know whether it really was or not. I, there wasn't much that my untrained eye could see. Uh, it, as I recall, we parked under some power lines and we hiked out to El Pato. Is that? Pato. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we passed the supposed racetrack on the way. It, mm -hmm. Is that indeed a racetrack? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. And that's a, that's a good example of where the uh, vintage photography helped us out because that was uh, one of the tracks that was getting a lot of vehicular traffic. Um, back in the day, you wouldn't have had to do that hike. You would have just driven right up to the Pueblo along the racetrack. And so BLM became aware of that. And so they closed that, that portion of the road off. Um, but yeah, that's actually a very large track. And we can see it in the, in the old aerial photos, like before there were any roads up there. So we know that's a, that's a solid one. We've got one more question here. Uh, just sort of a clarification, you indicated that you feel this was used more for endurance racing as opposed to like a dash type event, and is there any, is this just a supposition or is there anything that would, any evidence to support that? Yeah, that's based entirely on uh, ethnographic data that, that by and large these would be like um, endurance type events, and sometimes it would be one person. Um, running back and forth, sometimes it'd be relay teams and so forth. That's not to say, you know, all, by and large, everything that I, the story that I'm telling you guys is, I mean, like all of archeology, span it's just a story, you know, and, and um, we, we do the best with what we have, and I'm basing a lot of this stuff off ethnographic evidence, and in the Southwest, I think we're really fortunate because we do have the descendant communities, and there's such a continuity there between what they know as modern reality and the past that we're looking at. So all things being equal, I think we're remiss if we don't take advantage of that. And so yeah, when, when I make these suppositions, it's based on the, the ethnography. Well, Will, thank you very much for an oh. excellent presentation thank you. tonight. Thank you. Thank you.